Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> this is the common prayer, the first common prayer of second semester. Welcome back. Um, we would like to welcome you uh, on behalf of the Peace and Justice Center. I am Mike Lampy. I am a intern at the Peace and Justice Center. Uh, what we do uh, at the center is we promote the building of community through the study and practice of peace and justice curricular and co-curricular programming. We also like to encourage the way of peace building, the idea that you yourselves can peace build, either traveling around the world and helping others, or even peace building here in our community uh, through uh, cultural awareness as well as uh, promoting Catholic social teachings according to the mission and heritage, uh, and uh, also valuing Norbertine values as, uh, as far as service, community service, as well as um, as uh, working hard in our academics and our extracurricular activities. Um, we would like to commemorate this event on behalf of Martin Luther King. So would you, would you please rise and uh, sing our opening hymn, which will be We Shall Overcome, uh, and it is beginning on the first page. Welcome.
A reading from the prophet Isaiah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me? Says the Lord. I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fat, fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you? This trampling of my courts. Stop bringing meaning, meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot bear your evil assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Please the ca- plead the cause of the widow. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. The word of the Lord. A reading from the prophet Micah. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we will walk in his paths. The law will go go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the name of of their gods. We will walk in the name of the Lord, our God, forever and ever. The word of the Lord. This is an excerpt from the speech by Dr. Martin Luther King. It was made the day before he was killed, April 3rd, 1968, the day he was, before he was assassinated. If I were standing at the beginning of time with the possibility of a general and panoramic view of the whole human history up to now, and the Almighty said to me, Martin Luther King, which age would you like to live in? I would take my mental flight by Egypt across the Red Sea, through the wilderness on toward the promised land. And in spite of its magnificence, I would not stop there. I would move on by Greece and take my mind to Mount Olympus, and I would see Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Euripides, and Aristophanes assembled around the Parthenon as they discussed the great and eternal issues of reality. But I wouldn't stop there. I would go on even to the great heyday of the Roman Empire, and I would see developments around there through various emperors and leaders, but I wouldn't stop there. I would even come up to the day of the Renaissance and get a quick picture of all the Renaissance did for the cultural and ascetic life of man, but I wouldn't stop there. I would even go by the way that the man for whom I named had his habitat. And I would watch Martin Luther as he tacked his 95 theses on the door at the church in Wittenberg. But I wouldn't stop there. I would even come up on even to 1863 and watch a vacillating president by the name of Abraham Lincoln finally come to the conclusion that he had to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. But I wouldn't stop there. I would even come up to the early 30s and see a man grappling with the problems of the bankruptcy of his nation and come with an eloquent cry that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. But I wouldn't stop there. Strangely enough, I would turn to the Almighty and say, 
If you allow me to live just a few years in the second half of the 20th century, I will be happy. Now that's a strange statement to make because the world is all messed up. The nation is sick. Trouble is in the land. Confusion is all around. That's a strange statement. But I know, somehow, that only when it is dark enough can you see the stars. And I see God working in this period of the 20th century in a way that men in some strange way are responding. Something is happening in our world. The masses of people are rising up. And wherever they are assembled today, wherever they are, in Johannesburg, South Africa, Nairobi, Kenya, Accra, Ghana, New York City, Atlanta, Georgia, Jackson, Mississippi, or Memphis, Tennessee, the cry is always the same. We want to be free. And another reason that I'm happy to live in this period is that we have been forced to a point where we're going to have to grapple with the problems that men have been trying to grapple with through this history. But the demand didn't force them to do it. Survival demands that we grapple with them. Men for years now have been talking about war and peace, but now no longer can they talk about it. It is no longer a choice between violence and nonviolence but nonviolence or non-existence. As we think about those words that you just heard, you hear in that uh, some significant protest and at the same time a call to action that's based on hope. As we think about Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., we remember him as one who helped bring far-reaching change by giving voice to protest, encouraging strategic action, and inspiring hope. The Apostle Paul said in the letter to the Romans, we do not hope for what we see. And that is, we hope for what we want to see, but do not yet see. And as yearning for what we do not see, Hope thus always begins with protest. It begins with the confession that the circumstances of this present day are not what we're looking for. Contrary to the popular phrase, it's not all good. This is not yet the day of justice. Our hearts yearn for something more. Now, if we're to continue in the hopeful legacy of Dr. King, we must maintain hope in the midst of trying times. We must also maintain hope in the midst of seemingly routine times. To do that, we must continue to cultivate protest. We must continue to be alert to that which is not yet what we hope to see. That being said, there are three ways in which we might lose hope, three kinds of hopelessness. The first kind of hopelessness is perhaps the one with which we are most familiar. It's despair. The hopelessness of despair protests this present. It says, this isn't what I hope for, but I don't think it's ever going to change. And it's that last part that makes it futility and despair. There's a second kind of hopelessness, and that's presumption. Presumption also protests this present, but claims the ability to change it in and of ourselves. And presumption you might see as, for example, in uh, the Old Testament story of the Exodus, where the the people of Israel in the midst of their slavery were in despair. They had a complaint, but they didn't think anything would ever happen. Moses answered that despair initially with his own presumption as he rose up from his own place of privilege and struck and killed an Egyptian and found himself unable to deliver his people that way. So those are two kinds of hopelessness, quite different, despair and presumption, both protesting, one thinking it will never change, 
the second thinking we can change it ourselves. There's a third kind of hopelessness, though, and it's the one that is really the worst of the three, and it's apathy. Apathy no longer protests. Apathy thinks things are really okay, just as they are. Now, I grieve when I see despair. I mourn with those who despair. I cringe when I see presumption. It scares me to think of people who, who presume to have that power to themselves. But I have to say, I start to lose both patience and my own hope when I see apathy. When I see the kind of apathy that Dorothy Sayers described as the sin of sloth, in which she said, that is the soul that believes in nothing, cares for nothing, seeks to know nothing, interferes with nothing, enjoys nothing, hates nothing, finds purpose in nothing, lives for nothing, and remains alive only because there is nothing for which it will die. That's apathy. And it's the worst kind of hopelessness. By rekindling protest, making people uncomfortable, making the comfortable uncomfortable, King inspired hope. He was not satisfied with the status quo, and he gave voice to his protest. So he didn't despair. He didn't presume power. He expressed and acted upon his yearning, a yearning for the day of justice. As we move now to our time of response, I'm going to ask you to look inside as best you can and rekindle your own sense of protest to remind yourself of injustice, to give voice to your own yearning, to remember that it's not all good. It's not all okay. About two weeks ago, 150,000 people were killed, and now over a million remain displaced in, in Haiti. It's not all good. For what do you yearn? On this morning, there are about 25 wars going on around the globe. It's not all good. For what do you yearn? Many of you are here this morning in the midst of your own personal and hugely significant pain. It's not all good. For what do you yearn? I yearn for God to protect and strengthen the Haitian people in the midst of their deep despair. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. I yearn for healing and comfort for all those coping with the loss of a loved one. We pray to the Lord. I invite you to now share what you yearn for. Lord, hear our prayer. For all these intentions, both spoken and in our hearts, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. 
Uh, the first one being that um, outside in the gathering space, there will be a, uh, donations being received and welcomed uh, for Catholic Relief Services uh, to try to help out what's going on in Haiti because uh, things uh, still, there's still, they still need a lot of help, and we would appreciate uh, donations, and all of those uh, proceeds would be going to Catholic Relief Services uh, so that they can help out uh, down there. Um, also, I uh, would like to make the announcement that this evening uh, there will be um, uh, Barry Scott uh, is a speaker 
that is an impersonator, uh, impersonates Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Very good speaker. Tonight it will be at Fort Howard's Theater at 7.30 p.m. Oh, Walter Theater, I apologize. Uh, Walter Theater. Uh, so please, you are more than welcome to that. It's free and open to the public, uh, and we hope to see you there. Uh, thank you, and uh, have a great day.